Good evening. My name is uh, Olga Lebedeva. I'm working in the archive department in the Pieleski Institute here in Warsaw. And uh, I'm honored to moderate today's debate dedicated to the museums. Uh, but before we begin our debate, I would like to start uh, by expressing my support for Ukrainian people, our Ukrainian employees in the Pileski Institute and for the president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky. And I would like to propose a minute of silence in honor of the Ukrainian victims of the Russian invasion. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to announce that in reaction to the Russian Federation's invasion of Ukraine, the Pelecki Institute uh, formed Rafael Lemkin Center for Documenting Russian Crimes in Ukraine. Uh, the center collects the accounts of Ukrainian uh, civilians and military personnel to secure evidence of uh, crimes committed by the Russian troops in the territory of Ukraine. Uh, will be, there will be more information uh, about that uh, center soon. So, as we can see, unfortunately, the topic of human suffering and war has become very current. And today, uh, we focus on how these themes are being presented in the museum exhibitions. Uh, museums face challenges every day. For the story, from the stories they want to tell, uh, to being accessible to the wider audience. And today we are going to discuss problems faced in three very different European countries. Uh, we'll try to answer questions. Are museums the same in Poland or England or in Germany? What do all of these museums have in common? And what about objects? Are they important in telling the story uh, in the museum? I'd like to introduce my guests. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce Justin Maciejewski, DSO MB, uh, who is the director of the National Army Museum in London, following a 27 year career in the British Army. His last appointment in the British Army was as uh, director combat, as uh, a professional lead head of the Royal Armored Corps and the infantry. He holds an MA in Defense Studies from King's College in London, and he graduated in History from Cambridge University, where he specialized in British Imperial and Military History. Good evening. Good evening, Olga. <laughs> uh, my second guest today is uh, Dr. Alki Gruglewski, uh, who is the Managing Director of the Lover Saxony Memorials Foundation and the Director of the Bergen Belsen Memorial. She is also the former deputy director and head of the educational department of the Memorial and Educational Center of the House of Wannsee Conference in Berlin. And from 250 uh, to 220, she was the deputy director and head of their educational department. She was also a member of the independent panels on antisemitism, which was uh, established on the basis of the Bundestag resolutions. Good evening. Good evening. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Pawu Kielski, uh, who is a historian and political scientist between uh, 2014 to 2016. Uh, he was the deputy president of the Institute of National Remembrance in Penn. Uh, presently, he is the deputy director of the Warsaw Rising Museum. Good evening. Good evening. And before we start our discussion, I'd like to remember uh, that you can write questions on Q&A here in the bottom of the screen. Uh, you can write questions in English or Polish. I will read all questions in the end of our discussion. And I think we can start. And I would like uh, to address my first question for all of you. We have uh, such a large international audience and uh, not everyone has had a chance to be in London or Warsaw or in Germany. Uh, tell us a little bit about your museum. museum. Uh, what are you doing? And what is the most important message your museums are trying to deliver? 
Uh, maybe we can start from Dr. Alka Griglewski. Yes, first of all, let me thank you for the invitation to this event. I didn't know my colleagues before, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Um, Bergen-Belsen was a camp with different functions. In the very beginning, is, it was a camp for war prisoners, mainly from the Soviet Union. Later on, it became a concentration camp where Jewish prisoners were taken in order to be exchanged. This is how they called them to um, German war prisoners in other countries. But as the war continued, more and more prisoners from other concentration camps were brought there and so the circumstances got worse and worse. After the liberation, Bergen-Belsen continued to be a so-called DP camp, a camp for displaced persons um, until 1950. What is important to know about Bergen-Belsen is that although the documentation center that we have with an exhibition about this different periods of history is being perceived by young people as a museum, the place as a whole is not a museum, but a historical site. And this of course changes a lot uh, our mission. Our mission is of course remembrance. Our mission is preservation and collect um, objects that are related to the history we want and we have to tell about the history through educational programs. And we want to make people sensitive for a never again. What means never again can be make people sensitive against nowadays forms of anti-Semitism, racism, um, but it can be looked at, of course, in also a broader way. Maybe to begin with, this is enough. Thank you. Actually, I was in Bergen-Belsen Museum last week and I really enjoyed the, the, the main exhibition. Uh, okay, so the same question, uh, maybe Justin Maciejewski. Thanks very much, Olga and, and Elke. And uh, funny enough, you, you mentioning Bergen-Belsen, we have an exhibition at the moment in the National Army Museum called Foe to Friend. Uh, and it's a story of 75 years of the British Army being based in Germany since 1945. And, and in that exhibition, we have a, uh, the medical kit uh, the objects uh, that were held by the medical officer who was the first officer, medical officer into Bergen-Belsen uh, in the liberation in 45. Uh, so uh, Belsen and uh, it, it, the British Army ended up being stationed around Belsen for many years, right until a few years ago. So the history of Belsen uh, is very much part of the British Army story as well, uh, and its presence in Germany uh, since the since Second World War until recently. Um, I mean, I think the situation in Ukraine that you mentioned at the beginning, Olga, is a, is a real reminder to all of us of the importance of what we're discussing tonight, because what we're seeing tonight, uh, you know, in, in Ukraine, in, with, that, with the unprovoked attack by, by Russia uh, of Ukraine, in many ways, is what happens when people are allowed to distort history and weaponize history and create false narratives to justify, uh, you know, um, invasions of other people's uh, countries and sovereignty. Uh, the creation of false narratives uh, around history, which one hears with, with Putin all the time. And also we're seeing the consequence of other leaders in the West being allowed to forget about conflict and forget about the causes of conflict and the causes of war, uh, and to believe that history somehow has come to an end um, and that we, and geopolitics and geostrategy are things of the past. Uh, this is what Western Europe has been allowed to do since 1990, is somehow take a holiday from having to understand conflict and war uh, and these subjects. And I'm very conscious that Poland is a, is a frontline NATO state. Um, I'm very happy that the UK is, is, is very much uh, working closely with Poland on the material support to Ukraine. But I think that situation really is a reminder to all of us tonight as why understanding and debating the history of conflict and conflict itself is an important responsibility uh, and it's a it's a it's a responsibility that we're all very privileged as museum directors and and memorial directors uh, to be able to uh, to um, to take on. Um, and and so in terms of the National Army Museum in Chelsea, we were founded by Royal Charter in 1960, and our mission has not changed since 1960. Some of the words have been modernised, but our mission is to to tell the story of our army. 
uh, and the soldiers who've served in it uh, since uh, the restoration of the monarchy in 1660. So it's a long story going back to 1660. And I want to come back to the two things uh, about uh, the, the telling the story and our army, two, two things I'd like to, uh, to bring to life to help explain uh, the museum. Uh, we have a royal charter. We're the only museum in the country with a royal charter. The Queen had a very personal interest in the museum when it was founded. And uh, we have three tasks. Task, the first task is the museum itself, the collection of objects and the display of the objects and what they mean. The second task is one of research uh, to make sure that we are authoritative in the research of the history of our soldiers uh, and the army in which they served. And the third one is uh, is sharing the stories with the widest possible audiences through publication and our public program. Uh, and again, these are in our Royal Charter going back to 1960. Um, we never use the term history in isolation. We always use, to, in our Royal Charter, wherever it says history, it talks about history and traditions. And I think this is an important thing for a museum particularly, particularly an army museum and a national army museum. History is about understanding what happened, why. It's, a, it's, it's about rigorously researching and understanding uh, what happened. But traditions are about identity and what it means. And they're two different sides of the coin. And they must never get out of balance. If one overemphasizes identity, you distort uh, an understanding of history. And if you overemphasize history, you, you depersonalize it uh, to an extent that it becomes um, disconnected from the the people who are, who, are, who are viewing it. So these two things of history and tradition, I think are, are very important. And the second thing I wanted to talk about was what we mean by our army. We always talk about our army, not the British army at the National Army Museum. That's for a number of reasons. Uh, for, firstly, is it, it speaks to the fact that it's, it was written by the Queen, our Royal Charter. And I think she used the term our army uh, from uh, almost a personal point of view as the royal family. But also it's an army that serves the people of the United Kingdom. Um, and it's an army in which it's our ancestors, have many of have served. But also it's not just the British army, it's the Indian army, the African armies, the armies of, uh, of the British Empire, uh, where soldiers have been drawn from over 50 countries of the Commonwealth today. So we seek to tell the story, not just of British soldiers, but soldiers who have served the crown from right across the world and have, have played such an important part in our national uh, story. So we see ourselves very much as a living bridge between that, those history and traditions and the general public and also the serving army. Um, and so I'll leave it there um, and hand over, hand back to you, Olga. But you know, lots to pick up on in questions and discussion, obviously. Thank you so much. Uh, I like you mentioned a living bridge. Uh, in my opinion, it's, it's, it is important when museum is not just a place with objects, but there is, is there is something more. So thank you. And uh, Dr. Paweł Kielski. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, the invitation. I'm glad to be here. And yes, I totally agree with uh, what Justin just said about the history and its influence today in uh, when we were we are facing uh, a Russian invasion on Ukraine. Uh, to be honest, for uh, many years, I've been talking and uh, also uh, writing in my articles that history or remembrance is not just a mere soft power anymore. It is used sometimes as a hard power, and Putin is uh, Putin is using uh, it this way to uh, to justify his aggressions. So, so we can see the importance of uh, of uh, good understanding of uh, of history and and the past. Um, I've been in the museum of uh, in the Warsaw Rising Museum I, I've been from the very beginning um, with just this two years gap for for my service in uh, um, Institute of National Remembrance so I was uh, uh, one of the creators of uh, of the museum as an institution of its uh, um, of its exhibition and uh, I must say that also Rising Museum was the first modern narrative and interactive historical museum in Poland created after 1989. 
thus after regaining independence, and um, it started a kind of boom in Polish museology. Uh, if we compare numbers, in 2004, in Polish museums, there were 17 and a half million of visitors. In 2019, in Polish museums, it was more than 40 million. So it more than doubled. Uh, plenty of new museums uh, were created after, after we opened. Uh, and uh, I must say that Polish museology, which was a little bit, uh, or not only a little bit, outdated uh, before in 1990s, beginning of, uh, of uh, the new millennium, now is uh, uh, really uh, one of the most modern uh, in, uh, in the world. I, I wouldn't hesitate to, 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 to say so. Um, what is uh, our museum about and what, what is its strength? Um, it is about a story that can be told on three levels of understanding. And that's uh, why not only Varsovians, not only Poles, but also uh, people from abroad so eagerly come to our museum. The story of the Warsaw Rising, which uh, was the fight against Germans in uh, um, in advancing uh, in the face of advancing Red Army, can be understood on the local level because one city, Polish capital, was totally erased uh, during and after all inhabitants were expelled. So today's Warsaw is totally different city than it was before the war. It means from the point of view of the biggest Polish city and its identity, it is the most important event in its history. So this is the first level of understanding the meaning of, of the Warsaw Rising. Then we have national level, when in Warsaw in 1944, for the last more time before uh, 1989, fully legal Polish authorities were operating. They were they came from Polish underground states, subordinated to the um, uh, to the government in exile, fully legal. So, and then communists took power, and they were never fully legitimate, even though recognized, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the third level of understanding is the global one. It helps to understand um, the history of Second World War, where I would say that. Uh, after Norman Davis, uh, for example, that there were three sides of this conflict. So two totalitarian regimes and the world of Western democracies and the alliances changed. And during the Warsaw Rising, those two totalitarian regimes, de facto, even though not de jure, cooperated. Stalin stopped uh, Soviet offensive in order to allow Hitler to suppress the Warsaw Rising. So, this is very powerful story that can be told on all those levels and therefore uh, as it is told uh, in a narrative modern way it is really touching people and encouraging to come to to the museum and what is most important message so first of all if it is of course of course pay homage to the insurgents to their bravery, to the brave city that resisted total evil. Uh, but the other one is to present those universal values because those young people, most of them were not trained soldiers, they were volunteers, but it were the universal values such as freedom, democracy, independence that made them uh, fight against total evil. So those values are, are the most important and the most powerful uh, part of uh, our museum. So maybe a little bit too long, but uh, but I will put full stop here. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, as we know, there are a lot of challenges for the museums today. Maybe uh, you can list some of the major challenges that you currently, currently face in your work. Um, maybe we can start with uh, Dr. Rukielski. Okay, okay so, I will, I will oh, begin sorry. with the simple okay. ones. 
with I, I, did, did, did Okielski, Mr. You asked Mr. Okielski. I'm very sorry. Uh, you can you can start. No, <laughs> no, 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 no problem. <laughs> I excuse me very much. No, I got uh, I I heard my name, but I'm. Very uh, you sorry. you can start because uh, <laughs> I'd like to ask all of you about challenges. I'm very sorry. Um, yeah, well, I will I, I will begin. The very simple challenges are the is the distance history the distance of time to the history we are presenting and the changing customs of learning and teaching. So, but these I would say are the smaller challenges. Another challenge is the changing societies. We have a more and more diverse society and I think it makes us aware that pro we probably always had diverse societies, but only now that it's very much a focus on cultural diversity, we are aware of this diversity. And But what I perceive as the most challenging, and this connects maybe to what Mr. Okieski and Mr. Maciejewski said, is that we are living in times of a high insecureness within people. We have changing discourses. We have, at least in Germany, um, growing anti-Semitism, growing racism, um, strong right-wing extremism positions and people seek for easy answers and uh, when we talk about history in general there are not the one and only answers if we talk for example about the motivation of uh, policemen uh, that were acting within the mass shootings then you can tell at least five motivations why they participated in these mass shootings and so it's a challenge on the one hand to offer our audience orientation, but on the other hand, not to offer simple narratives that present just the one, the presumable one and only answer to the question. But um, to get in a dialogue with our audiences, to show them the complexity of history, to show them the complexity, what it means to learn for this, humanity values that you named, Mr. Okielski, that this is a very complex uh, aspect and that it's um, in some ways also a struggle, a struggle in a positive way. Yeah, I totally agree that uh, uh, this uh, growing gap from the history till today is one of the challenges. For example, one of the simplest one uh, of uh, challenges for us. When we were opening, we have several thousand of still living uh, veterans who could come, tell their stories, uh, teach, etc., etc. Today we have just several hundred of them, and we are facing the moment when none of them will be among us. And once the last person who remembers passes away, history is totally different, uh, uh, different kind of, uh, of history. So this is one of our uh, biggest challenges for, for the nearest future, how to deal with this moment when we lose the huge strength of our museum. Uh, we were treating veterans as a co-hosts of our museum. And they were, for many years, they were present in our museum every day. They were even coming to the exhibition, but they were not interested in the exhibition itself. They were interested in people there. And now we are facing the moment when they are, last of them are passing away. So this is, this is a huge, uh, a huge uh, challenge. For, for the nearest future. And of course, the second challenge connected to that is simply how to keep the interest of audience. Uh, every museum, once it's new, it is interesting. And according to museology theories, after a few years, the number of visitor decreases because this uh, strength of uh, novelty disappears. Fortunately, we didn't have such a decrease until the pandemic, of course. The pandemic is another challenge, but different kind of, uh, of challenge. 
but still how to keep the interest how to for example we are still perceived as a new modern museum but we are almost 18 years old so now people who were born when when we were opening are getting adults and their needs change in time the audience changes as uh, as elke said so how to keep um keep the museum still on top to be interesting for uh, for audience uh, that would make it uh, visit the museum thank you and what about the national army museum oh, so it's it's fascinating hearing different perspectives from elka and uh, and pavel on, on this I, I i think that um we're, we're quite fortunate in the national army museum in, in that we've been uh, re rebuilt uh, and refreshed in the last five years so we're quite we feel quite quite current but i i i think that is obviously something we're thinking about in the future how do we stay current um but i think this issue that uh elka raised about about the sort of um you know you know we're trying to tell stories in a world that's getting more and more divided and more and more polarized uh and that 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 uh poses a a significant challenge i mean with the warsaw rising it's a strong story and a simple story a powerful story is is quite easy to tell in a way because it's so black and white good and evil i mean you can you can you can lay it out i think with the story of the british army over 350 years it's a much more nuanced story um and um um we we're in a world that's much more politicized mm -hmm. history has been weaponized by by various uh uh, various constituencies, um, none of whom really want the truth. What they want is to kind of uh, have a particular viewpoint reinforced with a few objects. Um, and so we have to navigate um, quite a difficult path to make sure that we uh, tell the stories that should be told. Uh, we're not uh, a museum that is a kind of national hagiography, uh, uh, we're, you know, a worship of the army. We've got to tell the story as it is. But also we have to be empathetic to those people who have served. We've got to be a story where, where the soul of the nation's army is being represented as well. Um, and so this requires us to move, uh, move quite carefully. Again, going back to one of Elka's points, you know, some of the most interesting stories to tell are, are ones that are remote in history, the 18th century, the early 19th century, Waterloo, and the Napoleonic Wars. These are very interesting stories. For example, most young people in this country would assume that Germany had been Britain's long standing enemy uh, through history. But of course, it's not true. I mean, uh, you know, the 18th century uh, and the Napoleonic Wars uh, are allies of Germany and France was the enemy. Um, and so telling people this nuanced story uh, in a way that keeps them engaged, even though it's quite remote and it's quite politicized, is, I think, the, the challenge um, uh, that we face. And I think that other point is about insecurity. Um, we are in a world where people's identity is constantly being challenged. National identity is being challenged by the, the globalizing world. Um, sexuality is being challenged by people, uh, you know, all sorts of things, religion, all sorts of belief systems are being challenged by the world in which we live today. And that's creating a very insecure uh, population in all sorts of dimensions. And when they come to a museum, they don't want to be challenged again. <laughs> They want to be, they want to feel secure. But having said that, there are some subjects that need to be raised, which are quite challenging. So for me, walking this uh, journey is, is one that requires great sensitivity uh, and it requires uh, an open mind. Um, it does require what I would call a master narrative. What is the big story about Pavel? You know, Pavel talked about the big story of Warsaw Rising at the city level the national level and the international level. I think in any museum now, or any, any uh, cultural site, one needs to be very clear about what is the story, but do it in an open, not a closed way, and then be able to debate um, um, around the edges of that story. But one has to be very clear about what is the central story. Otherwise, with all the difficulties we face today, uh, as were brought to life by Elka, we, we can end up with a load of objects that don't say anything. So uh, how do you respond to the challenges to effective practices within museums? 
what can we do? I mean, I, 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 I think that um, it's very important that museums don't judge. I think, mm -hmm. I think one of the things which I think is really worrying about the museum sector is the museum sector thinks that it has to have a position. It has to be, has to be a sort of, uh, they have to be a kind of warriors for a cause. And I, and I don't believe that. I believe that museums need to lay out things in a way that makes people think and reflect, but museums shouldn't drive an agenda. Um, so I think being objective as far as possible, it's not easy, but as far as possible, being neutral and sensitive uh, and, and with a degree of intimacy, but not passion is quite important in order that you make your museum as accessible to the widest possible audiences that you might receive. So, um, but I think a lot of people now regard museums as kind of campaigning institutions. And I, I think this is really worries me because it, it ends up taking museums in, in one of two directions and, and both of which will end up adding to the polarization of people. I think museums need to be a bridge that bring people together. So that, I think that's how you, you listen, you try and stay neutral, you maintain intimacy with p human stories through objects, but you, uh, you, uh, you don't uh, adopt a campaigning position would be my, my reflection after four years as a museum director. I'm, const I'm conscious with Pavel and Elka, I'm, an, I'm a, a relative newcomer to this world. So I would, I would love to hear, hear their thoughts, but those are my thoughts after, after four years in the job. Well, yes, yeah, so, uh, I will start with the, the challenge that is worrying us probably the most. I mean, the passing away of veterans. So we are trying now, we just started a program to engage the families, the second, third generation to those who are devoted to this value, those values, and they would like to be in close cooperation with the museum to uh, to keep um, the, the 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 touch of uh, of of the veterans of the insurgents etc etc. Et um, the other challenge I would say is how to create uh, the interesting uh, exhibition today, um, or keep the interest of, of 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 the changing society because the. The, the expectations, as I said, are changing, uh, and the museum has to be always on time. And what I've learned uh, for that 18 years in, in the museum is that um, in the end, museum does not have to uh, be totally modern on all levels. So. I mean, multimedia is something that gets old the most quickly. And you have to find the balance between different tools used and sometimes have at least some much more old school, old school, uh, old school uh, tools to, uh, to have the interaction with the visitor, not to just to uh, have a lot of multimedia, most modern multimedia. People have most modern multimedia all over the world at, at their homes. So they are not coming to the museum to see only the multimedia. So, uh, so this, is, this is another, uh, another way of uh, dealing with the challenge. I will give you uh, also an example how to deal with a challenge how to present the the cruelty of war the um the atrocities in our museum we have several points where the atrocities are described this is this is of course uh, uh, the ghetto and the ghetto uprising the terror during the occupation the uh, uh, genocide in the beginning of the war, so rising done in the western district of, um, uh, of, of Warsaw. And we try not to show to drastic photographs. And if we do so, they are hidden in a special, I would call it wells, 
to protect children from seeing inside. And what is more, organized uh, guided tours are allowed on only for children above 12 years old. Because we have uh, offer for young younger children, but they are they, they have lessons that are consulted with the uh, psychologists, uh, children psychologists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are different different levels of of challenges. Of course, this is the the high level. So how to uh, present the history in the most objective way? How to present it in in the best way? Not not to give all the answers, but to present it uh, uh, on multi-level or in all its complexity. But we face also such a, uh, I would say, minor, but also important challenges. Well, I would like to connect to what Justin said <laughs> and allow me to contradict <laughs> because you use the terms not to judge and you use the term neutral. Um, in, in the memorial sites, we are not neutral. We are definitely advocates of the survivors and we are definitely um, not neutral in the, in the point on how to present German history. Now, the challenge is to present this history not in a neutral form, like it was very obvious that it was a dictatorship, a German di dictatorship, it were German perpetrators um, in, 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 in the concentration camps in Germany. And the challenge is now not, not to manipulate our visitors, although we have a very clear position. So the challenge is to show the history, not in a black and white history, but with all its gray zones and to offer the participants to develop within this frame, a own relation to the history. That means um, when I say to, to offer our audience the possibility to develop their own position, it does not mean that it's, um, they can develop any answer. You know, we're not going to, um, if, a, if somebody in the memorial site will come up with the idea that what we are telling them is exactly the same like whatsoever, like when, you know, we, we've had the problem in Germany during the last year is that people went to the streets and protested against the hygiene rules of Corona and uh, equalized themselves with Sophie Scholl and Anne Frank and, and so on. So this is, of course, something we will not um, allow sounds very strong, but you understand what I mean, you know. Uh, but, but still, as I said, um, the challenge is to point out very clearly whose advocates we are and at the same time um, show the history not in a simplified black and white story, but with all the gray zones, um, with all the, with all the um, gray zones also in, in humanity. You know, I mean, we have the situation that um, victims became perpetrators, perpetrators became victims in certain situations and, and um, that we have to present in an age appropriate way. Here, I'm very much with Pavel. It has to be a not overwhelming age appropriate way, but going deep into the complexity. I would like to uh, add something because I agree that uh, the objectivity or well, objectivity yes, but uh, you you cannot uh, totally misjudge. Um, in our museum, of course, as uh, Justin said, the story is to some extent black and white. So we know who who were the good guys and who were the bad guys. Uh, we have two totalitarian regimes and uh, 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 strong will to freedom and independence. So in this sense. Uh, there cannot be, uh, I don't know, feeling that, well, there were two sides of the war, nobody was good, they were just fighting. Of course not. But on the other hand, I would agree that uh, there are also topics that uh, cannot have ultimate uh, answer. For example, in Poland, there is uh, ongoing debate whether it was uh, 
good decision to start the Warsaw Rising and whether it was a good decision to start it on that particular day or not. And this heated debate is still ongoing and we do not deliver uh, answer whether it was good or not. But definitely we deliver answer that um, Poles fighting uh, against total oppression of uh, Nazi Germany were the good guys and the Nazi regime and also uh, Soviet Russia were the bad guys. I mean, Pavel, it's so fascinating you mentioned that. I mean, my father was a, a veteran of the Home Army in the Warsaw Rising, and uh, and he used to have a different answer depending on what mood he was in. Uh, uh, you know, uh, so some days he would say we had to do it, and other days he'd say we were mad to do it. You know? And I remember having both uh, uh, both. Um, hearing both sides of that argument from the same person so i think i think that's a very a very good example and i suppose uh elka i think i think given the stories that's, that some of the stories you're telling at the memorial sites it, it is it is very important i think for me it's slightly more uh in my position it's slightly more subtle i mean the example would be perhaps the um uh you know the british empire let's take let's take the british empire as an example um you know it's not black and white uh it's 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 a much more it's a much grayer story um, and a lot of people would want us to tell us, tell it, in fact, no, I'll tell a better example, slavery. So the British army um, bought thousands of slaves uh, in the West Indies in the 1790s to fight the French because they, they were perceived as being able to survive the tropical diseases better than British soldiers who were dying, you know, 50% of a regiment would die. So the British army decided to buy slaves. So this is, this that we're in a world where people want to portray that in a certain way but it's a more subtle story because the British army bought them as slaves from the ships and then gave them weapons and then paid them and then put them under military law not slave law and then the British army persuaded parliament to change the law to make them free men and declare them free because they couldn't be slaves and soldiers of the crown at the same time. And that, uh, that, that uh, campaign by the army to change the law was the first law that led to the emancipation of slaves uh, in the British West Indies and, uh, and the abolition of the slave trade. So the, the British army was at the forefront of the debate to end slavery in the, in the late 18th century, but nevertheless, the army bought slaves. And so how we tell this story uh, in a responsible way, in a way that now al allows people to understand the debates going on at the time is quite a subtle one. And it's, it's, it lends itself to being laid out in a, war, in a more factual, neutral way, rather than a way that is kind of, if you like, um, a very firm narrative. I think if I was telling the story of the Warsaw Rising or or dare I say, Bergen Belsen, it would, it would lend itself to that strength of narrative. But there are some stories in the history of the British Army um, that, that have to be navigated through in a more subtle way. Otherwise, some of the richness of the story and the nuance and the understanding um, is, is lost. And of course, you, going back to the example of the, um, of the British uh, Army's uh, soldiers, who, who uh, West Indian soldiers who were originally purchased the slaves, they, won, they, went, they were given land and pensions when they finished their service. So they, they were some of the first landowners to be uh, Afro-Caribbean, uh, and they became the middle classes of countries like Jamaica. And so the, the heritage of those soldiers has ended up you know, creating the middle class of some of these islands in the Caribbean. And so it's a fascinating story, and it requires to be told uh, quite carefully. Um, and of course, service for those people was a source of great pride. In fact, they went back to West Africa and fought against slave traders in West Africa in the 1820s and 30s. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's that's why I've I mean, I, when I started the job, I thought it could be a lot more simple than it than it, <laughs> than it is. But I've realized that uh, there are some stories that you can be emphatic about, but there are other stories you have to be much more nuanced about the, the gray zone, as you call them, Elka, I think very helpfully. Yeah. Exactly. I, I, I would like to say that it is very important in the wor work of historian, but even more in the work of someone who does popularization of history, because uh, it is a much broader audience, to, on the one hand, to give the context 
to understand better that the context was, was totally different, but on the other hand, not to relativize. So, and you always have to search for, for balance to how to present the context and not to relativize some past events. So this is, this is always something that you have to find the best solution in those, as you mentioned, gray zones. Okay, thank you. Yeah, can I, I'd love to ask, uh, um, Sure. It's really, <laughs> what it's about, and both of you are telling Second World War stories, and Second World War stories are part of the story that I'm telling, but they're not by no means the, the main, the, the, the full story. But what I find is that the Second World War generates interest. I mean, people are fascinated with the Second World War in a way they're not fascinated with the 18th century or 19th century. But what I've noticed is because it's so popular, the Second World War, there's a danger that it becomes popularized uh, and it becomes, you, you, it's a way of gener generating audiences because it's, it is such a powerful story. Um, and some of the things I've noticed are, are sort of, there's a sort of morbid fascination with the Second World War, which, which, which disturbs me somewhat. And um, I just wonder how you both deal with this, um, this fascination, but sometimes it, it can become an un unhealthy fascination with the, the Second World War. I, I'd love to, Pavel and, and Elke, understand how you do with it, because I'm beginning to, as we refresh our galleries, there's been lots of demand for more Second World War more you know nazis and the history of nazis generate footfall um for the shop for the cafe for the you know museum but actually i don't want to distort the horse this history that i'm trying to tell so I, i'd love your reflections on how you how you tread that tightrope well i mean in, in germany we talk about the category dark tourism there are british groups for example coming with the uh, tours that are called battlefield tours and so, yes, I'm absolutely uh, with you that there's this morbid aspect um, related to the topics that we are telling. It's not so strong because very soon people understand that it has something to do with human beings, you know, with human beings being discriminated, being excluded, and in the end uh, being murdered. And at that stage in general, we have to take care more about the aspect of not overwhelming our audiences. For example, if you, I mean, you, you talked about the relation of the British army with Bergen-Belsen, it's essential. And there are many, many films and photographs left that were taken by the British army who were forced to burn down the camp due to the hygienic situation. And there are, I don't know how many thousands of photos left of, how they had to, you know, push together the dead corpses and, and um, bury them. And these are very, very, very strong uh, pictures that affect people in a, in a very strong way. So in general, it's, it's, well, up from a certain point, it's more the point of taking care that they're not overwhelmed and are not left in something like a uh, fatalism that uh, human beings are bad and that they always are bad and you know it's 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 like how will you give these audiences a perspective um, very often this is interesting that very often it's something like a helplessness when when especially young men start to discuss with you military questions and you feel that it's it's something like a substitute in, not, in order not to confront the crimes that were committed, then they, they go into hiding with these technical aspects about, uh, you know, uh, what fight was fought when, and uh, even technical questions related to the gas chambers. So it's the, the point of morbid is, is one that I didn't meet so very often. Colleagues tell me a lot about it, especially in relation with the uh, historical sites where you have, uh, like the Wevelsburg, you know, where, where Himmler and high ranking um, SS members went to celebrate their, their 
um, you know, these, these German, German tra traditions, there you have uh, a lot of groups coming, which are fascinated in this sort of ideology and in this uh, celebrations that they had there. I would say that in Poland, uh, this uh, fascination about uh, German troops, Wehrmacht, etc., etc., is uh, uh, rather not uh, very common, uh, as uh, six million of Polish citizens lost their lives during the Second World War. It means that probably every family has uh, some victim. Uh, but of course, it even here it exists to to some extent. So, for example, for uh, for many years, the Hitler's bunker was in private hands, and well. Uh, those private owners were making money on uh, on such a dark tour tourism. Uh, so it happens also. Um, in our museum, I already explained how we deal with the, this, I would say, morbid problem. So we try to not, not to present to drastic scenes, or at least to prevent children from seeing them, because uh, and for example, the slaughter of Vola, I mean, this uh, mass genocide during the Warsaw Rising is presented not by photographs, but by um, protocols of exhumation, which are very touching, but are not showing the pictures of, uh, uh, of um, that, uh, that people. So, uh, so this, is, this is one point. Second point is that, uh, of course, uh, uh, the a kind of um, fashion on uh, on the topic of the Warsaw Rising, po Polish underground state, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, makes some people to uh, well to believe that it was uh, a great adventure to be in the un underground movement, and even though we try to present on our exhibition values and uh, and also smiling faces of people who after five years were able to fight openly against uh, against German terror against the occupants that uh, killed millions of uh, of Polish citizens but we show also destroyed city uh, graves mass mass graves uh, in Warsaw etc etc so, uh, we try to balance this this uh, this picture, um, and uh, I would say that uh, that we manage to do so to some extent. Uh, but of course, it is always very hard to balance everything and to present. And and of course, uh, people who create exhibition have their own expectations write very detailed scenario and believe how this scenario what should what it should tell to the visitors but then after you open it it begins its own life so people interpret it and sometimes they interpret it not in the way we would like to so this is also i would say a kind of challenge that you never reach with your message all, all the visitors because sometimes they understand something totally different. Justin, may I add something? Because while listening to, to Pavel, I was thinking maybe you meant with the word morbid also something that we would call here voyeurismus. And this we face, for example, in relation to the topic of medicinal experiments in concentration camps. You know, there's something, I don't know, if I wouldn't call it fascination, but that you come to a point where people connect to this topic and this is what they want to see and this is what they listen, want to listen to, you know, all these details of cruelties that existed. And there we can only address by age appropriateness you know, like not presenting these topics to young people who are not able to understand the whole context and, um, you know, who, who 
perceive these stories only as something sensational and uh, don't really understand what it's all about. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it, I think it's what I've, uh, it, you're, 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 I think you're, you've described it better there than I did in my question, but it's, what I've been struck by is that, um, that there's a sort of fascination with, with it in, in very, people go very deep in certain areas, you call it sort of technical areas, and they get completely obs obs fascinated by certain aspects of it. And um, you, you could you could meet you could do more to meet the, some of these demands, but I'm not sure it, it's good for the museum to to go beyond certain points in in, in laying out the story of the Second World War. Obviously, from the British Army's point of view, it's a it's it's not as it's a it's a relatively straightforward story of mobilization and and, and fighting in various different theatres on the you know on the side of good versus evil. But so it's it's quite straightforward. But people often would often say, why have you just got British objects here rather than where, where are the German objects and we'll say well this is a story about British soldiers um, it's not about uh, you know the Waffen SS division that was fighting in Italy or you know it's a it's about what it means to be a soldier and what it means to fight and what it means to to be in a war and all the you know the uh, challenges of that and, and the and the, the moral dilemmas that people face and all the, all these things um, but I've just been struck by the fact that you're both running institutions, uh, obviously right at the kind of extreme of, of the Second World War, but they are nevertheless, as you said, Elka, the, there are these people who, who have these fascinations with certain aspects of this history, which must be difficult for you to kind of satisfy in a way that, that um, uh, maintains balance within the museum. And, and, and there are certain audiences that probably you're, you, you deliberately don't cater for, I suspect. Um, and I'd be fascinated to know how you navigate that. I mean, because I think you're dealing with a much more uh, extreme stories than I, than I am in the National Army Museum, but I'd love to, Elka and, and Powell to, to, where do you not go? I mean, you talked about children and protecting them from certain images, but I think, it's, and I saw it in the museum, Powell, and it, it's fantastic that we have those wells that you can, if you want a parent and you really want to show people you can, but you know you can never unsee a photograph so i think the way you do it is very it's very responsible at the warsaw rising museum but i'd love to know what you exclude where you decide that you're just not going to touch as as institutions dealing with these very difficult subjects uh you mentioned all of you actually mentioned objects and uh, i have a question what is the role of objects in the museum narration Maybe we can we can start with uh, Pablo Kalski. Yes. Well, the object is uh, is of course the most powerful tool, but it is, and it was the part of our revolution in Polish museology. So thinking of object as of a tool. So before museologists were focused on objects maybe not only but almost only so we had the feeling that the exhibitions historical exhibitions uh, before we opened um, uh, Warsaw Rising Museum were uh, huge uh, rooms with many objects each object was in a described in a very detailed way in many cases, understandable only for historians or specialists on, on that period of history. And nobody cared if uh, uh, a visitor would understand it. So we not only changed this, uh, this attitude to the description about the object, but also we changed the attitude to the role of, uh, of the object. Object is also a tool. So first of all is a scenario of, um, uh, of, of, of the exhibition. So the narrative line, very detailed. In our case, it was uh, more than 100 pages of, uh, of typed text with very detailed description. Also what tools will be used in different parts of of the exhibition. So we use very different tools. Team that won the competition for the, for the exhibition 
consisted of uh, three guys who uh, who had different experience one was computer graphic uh, second was uh, architect and the third was a uh, scenographer and they had very great variety of tools to, to to propose and of course as i mentioned the object is the most important tool because it gives the uh close tie to the history and it is always much more powerful to have a i don't know little prayer written by a young girl in 1944 than to have the most modern i don't know multimedia um uh, touch screen or something for thousands of of dollars so of course objects are very important you as i mentioned already uh multimedia should not be overused but everything must be subordinated to the story to strengthen the story to make it comprehensible uh, and if you use objects in a proper way they are very very strong okay, thank you uh, Dr. Grigolevsky, maybe you have something to add? Yeah, it's not such an easy question because yes, of course, Pavel is right by saying objects are strong, but as far as I see it, the object itself does not speak to the audience without us being interpreters. That means it's very often the question how you put in scene an object. And here it's interesting for me that I come from a place or I came from a place where we didn't have object where the building, the house of the Wannsee Villa at the Wannsee was, a, was one object and the second object was the protocol of this meeting. And now I'm working in a place where we have many objects. We have um, plates, you know, objects that were found during excavations, mostly objects coming from the victims um and and we have many interesting objects especially from the last period of the camp and there i perceive that the most interesting object for the audience are for example diaries diaries written by the victims and still without giving these objects a context they will not be you know they they will not speak to the to the audience and i myself on a personal level think that also sources can be extremely important and interesting objects like if you take all the documents i mean germans were very perfect in documenting what they were committing all the crimes and if you take these documents you can really understand a lot a lot about this regime about the system about how language was misused and so on. But as I said, you always need to put it in context and you need to, somebody said, I think it was you just in building a bridge between history and um, the audience. I think we are the ones building these bridges to make the objects understandable, to make them relevant to them. I totally agree with, uh with Pavel and Elker, actually. I'm sorry, I can't create a, a, a discourse here because I, I, I do, um, it, it is, the object is definitely the bridge between the narrative, the story and the, and the audience. Um, and what I have come to realize is that is an object without a personal story is a very difficult thing to work with. Um, and, and objects that do have personal stories um, are, are much easier. Um, and I want to just, just again, go back to that issue of the challenge. So a lot of people want to come to the military and army museum to see guns. You know, they're fascinated by guns. Well, guns without a personal story are, are not that interesting to me. They need to be guns that were, that, that have a particular story behind them, rather than the, the collection of all the different guns uh, that the, you know, the British army may have used, uh, uh, you know, during its, during its story. So it's about the, the story behind the object that I think is the most powerful and how that story is a part of the jigsaw puzzle for the overall uh, uh, a narrative. Um, having said that, I think we also have a responsibility to collect objects that we may not display, 
but ensure that we have a comprehensive uh, collection of objects that sit behind the museum. And I think this is where the the three missions or, of the, or the three tasks of the National Art Museum and, and any museum, I think, is, you know, collection and display is about objects and how we harness them to tell the human stories that we're telling. But the research um, uh, objective requires us to be comprehensive in the way we collect. Uh, so I think we've where we've come to is, which I think is a very good place, is we distinguish between the collections we have that give us authority um, uh, as, as storytellers and the objects we choose to display in order to tell the story to our audiences and distinguishing between the two. Uh, you know, what we're not doing is running an open warehouse. Uh, we're, we're, telling, we're telling a story. Um, the other thing that I've come to realize uh, is, is that numbers and statistics uh, dehumanize the history we're telling uh, to a large extent. When we can personalize it, around families and individuals, it, it becomes much more, much more important. I think there was a time where we, we led with, with statistics and scale. Um, and actually now that almost becomes context. What we're leading with is our individual stories. And I, I think that, 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 is a, that serves as a much better bridge when it comes to objects, um, would, be my, would be my reflection. Okay, thank you. May, may I add one thing? Because sure. I think it's really interesting what you said, Justin, with this, I'm to I totally agree with you with these two types of collections that we have. And I would like to add one aspect. I think it's important for a critical thinking that we make it transparent to our audiences, that we are displaying specific objects and make also the criteria transparent to them and also make transparent to them that there are objects that we're not displaying. I think this is what belongs to the first part, what we were discussing, um, not to present history as if, you know, this is the only one uh, answer to something, but to make transparent that we are, we are also, it sounds very negative. I don't need it negative at all, but it's my decision which object I'm presenting. It's, I, I'm taking influence on history. Somebody else would come and maybe take a different object than the one I chose. Okay, thank you. And I think now it's time for the questions from our audience. Uh, uh, okay. I will read it in Polish. Dobry wieczór. Chciałabym zapytać, jaka państwa zdaniem będzie rola muzeów historycznych w przyszłości? What's the role of historical museums in future? Maybe we can start with yes, from Paweł Kielski. Thank you. Okay, so, of course, it's a very difficult question on the one hand because we are not science fiction writers and we don't know what will be in 100 years but on the other hand the answer from my point of view is quite simple so uh, they will be still existing and they will be still important for people we can see the as, as i said um, historical museums in poland are now uh, having their boom people are interested in, in, in the history. So history told in the interesting way is always fascinating for people um, on multiple levels. Uh, and the only task for us who run the museums, uh, who create the museums, etc., etc., is to find every well, for every generation, find the interesting way of telling the story, the, the way that would make them get interested. And I, I'm perfectly sure that uh, in the, well, future that is to be foreseen, uh, the role of historical museums will not change. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Alka Griglavsky, do you think about future of historical museums? I think it won't change because it will still be our job to make people understand the relevancy. I think this is really something we have to take, take care about. What is the relevance of the history we are presenting for 
today. And it can be today 2022, but it can be also today 2025. So what will change is the period that we have to talk about, like the exhibitions on national socialism in Germany in general don't end with 1945, but we talk about the aftermath, we talk about the continuing lines of certain ideologies and so on in order to make it understandable for our audience why there is something between a link between the history and the today. And I think this will continue. Probably the methods will change, the technology will change and so on. But the role, at least for the next 10 years, I see as a similar one. I would even go deeper into it, the situation in the last two years, this year, this day, shows us that there is a huge relevance for our sites and that we have to think more about the question and how to make this transparent to our audience. Yeah, I, mean, I would love to pick up on Elka's point made earlier, earlier on this evening about insecurity. And, and um, I think we are living in a world where people are increasingly insecure about their place within the world, not just in terms of uh, their place spatially, but their place historically. Um, in, in a timeline, uh, where do, how you know how do we fit? Where do we fit in? Who are we? Issues of identity are becoming you know very important, and I and I think that history, it, it, with the demand for history in all its forms, uh, books, you know, uh, you know, multimedia, you know, internet, and and museums will will grow. Um, I mean, we've seen consistent growth year on year before the pandemic in our visitor numbers. Um, you know, it's, 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 we've never had a year where we have been open and numbers have gone down. Um, so that, that tells us something. It tells us that there is an appetite for history. I was fascinated to, to talk to uh, somebody who works for one of the major book uh, sellers in this country, in Britain. Um, half the history books in Britain are military history books. Uh, in the widest sense, they're about leaders, they're about soldiers, they're about social history of war. But but the, 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 so not just is history going to maintain its relevance for people, but this uh, this notion of conflict and how that shapes us as peoples, I think, will remain relevant to people. And of course, what's happening today, as Elka said, is is a reminder that this is not prosaic. This is not something that's in the past. It's something that's real today. As, as we're seeing in Ukraine. So I look to the future and, and think that what we're doing is, is, is very relevant and will we'll still be in demand in years to come. We may tell stories in different ways, but, 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 but museums are not gonna go anywhere. And I think the growth of museums in Poland is a classic example of what happens when history is suppressed. Uh, when, when you open the lid, it, it, will, it, it will jump out uh, and grow. And so um, the growth in Poland has been rapid since 1990. But I think it will maintain steady growth across all of our countries now, um, uh, given the world we're living in. So there'll be my reflections. Thank you. And we have like five minutes, uh, but I want to read the second question. Uh, is there any chance that there will be a museum of uh, a Russian-Ukrainian war? Well, first of all, it has to end. So not before, uh, uh, but uh, yes, I'm deeply convinced that there will be such a museum. Uh, this is a historical event we are facing today that, uh, that is changing the world for decades. And I'm pretty sure that there is no possibility that such a museum will not emerge. Uh, so the question is only when and where. Um, and I hope it will be created quite soon in a free independent Kiev. Um, I'm, I can tell you that because after Maidan, there were, of course, plans, and there are, of course, plans to create a museum of Maidan. And due to some administrative reasons, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it, it is not uh, prepared so far. And when I met my 
many Ukrainian colleagues, I was always saying that it is one of the top priorities to create such a museum because it's a huge story, great identity building story. Again, fight for universal values as in our case, in the case of the Warsaw Rising. So I was, I was telling them that it is top priority. And if Maidan Museum was top priority, this brave, courageous uh, defense of Ukraine against Russian inv invasion is 10, 100 times more top priority for the independent state of Ukraine. So yes, it will emerge. I hope it will emerge very, very soon in the independent Kiev. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. Maciejewski. Yeah, no, I was just going to, uh, there will be a museum. Hopefully it'll be <laughs> a museum written by a free Ukraine, as Pavel said. Uh, my son is in the army and my son was in Ukraine last year training uh, the Ukrainian army. And uh, he remember at the time he said, you know, dad, this was great fun and really enjoyed it and great people. But, you know, when you were a young officer in the army, you were in Northern Ireland, you were in the Balkans, uh, you know, and, and I remember saying to my, to my son, uh, my eldest son, um, to, uh, you know, you, you, every, every page uh, that every soldier, every, every page is, of history is written by soldiers in different times and you never get to choose what page you're writing. But, you know, you're you're here to train these people in, in Ukraine and you're here to do deal with the pandemic uh, as well uh, as, a, as a young soldier. So um, I think you know, what, whatever soldiers do and that, like those brave Ukrainian soldiers uh, and, and people in Ukraine will write their own page in history. And that one day that will be displayed in a museum. Um, and as Pavel said, hopefully in a free Ukraine. Thank you. And Dr. Uh, Griglewski. I think there's not much to add. I'm not sure if it's going to be an isolated museum on this, this event, this specific event now, or whether it's going to be a museum that presents the longer scale on the relations of the, of the region, you know, because I mean, we had, uh, we, there was something like, a, I don't know if it's euphemistic to say conflict since 2014. So, but I'm not, I, I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm some, I can foresee history, but uh, so I will just leave it with the comments from my colleagues. I will add one thing. Maybe I'm a dreamer, but I would like to see such a museum also in Moscow as a part of deputinization. Okay, so thank you for your answers. And unfortunately, we're running out of time. So I would like to thank you all for that very interesting discussion. I hope that there will be more discussions about the museums because the museums is a, is a very important topic. And uh, I hope we, we will have another, another, uh, another discussion in the Pilatski Institute maybe soon. So thank you again and uh, good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Goodbye, bye Elka, bye Pablo. Bye. 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 bye.